Thank you for joining us online at Path Point Fellowship Church, where we bring God and people together. If you're ever in the Amarillo area, we want to invite you to join us at one of our services. They're at 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. Also, if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do that by going to pathpointfellowship.com slash giving and choose the option that is best for you. Now, we hope that you enjoy the message, that it's relevant, and that it impacts your life today. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? Praise God. Listen, I'm just going to speak over tummies right now. Just the Lord quickened that in me. I speak to tummies right now. Be settled down in Jesus' name. Just settle down. I speak to kind of flu bugs, any viruses, symptoms of it, anxiety, fear, all those kinds of things. I speak and speak peace to you in the name of Jesus. Do you receive that right now? Do you receive a healthy season? I know we're going into transition, but do you receive health in this transition? Flu bugs, viruses, all those kinds of the crud, everything. That shall not come near us, right? We're covered by the blood of Jesus. We're covered by the word of God. So we receive that. Shout to God. Thank you, God. We receive health and healing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, I'm Joe. I'm your teaching pastor this morning, and it's a privilege to be here with you. And, uh, well, you asked for it, okay? So you asked for it. That's the series we started off. This is week two of four weeks. We're going to be talking about relationships. And, um, you know, I don't know about you, but from what your experiences have been like in relationships, from where I stand, you know, relationships can be messy, can't they? They can be messy. Yeah, everybody's agreeing. Messy relationships happen all the time. And, um, you know, let's get on. If we get gut le- talking about our stomach, our tummies, okay? If we get gut level honest with each other, you don't want me to get all up into your stuff, and I don't want you to get all up in my stuff, right? Can we be real? So, you know, honestly, I'm quite fine if I just wrap myself up in some caution tape, okay? Crime scene tape, don't cross this line, and you do the same. And let's not talk about relationships actually at all. Let's just talk about something that's kind of um, uninvasive, non-threatening. Let's talk about end times, okay? I know when we did our series or our survey a couple months ago, there were three of you, and I think I was one of you, that said, hey, let's hear your teaching on the end times. It's safe. It's easy. It won't mess with us, okay? So I say we just do a a little talk here on end times, um, and then we go home, watch some football, and we just be happy, right? There you go, and if you have to drink some beers to get even happier, I might be okay with that. Just stay away from my comfort zone, and I'll stay out of yours, okay? Well, I don't think I'm going to get away with that. Amen. (laughs) Well, okay. (laughs) Especially since, like Pastor Keith said last week, an overwhelming majority of you said, you know what? I want to hear something about relationships. I want to know what God has to say about relationships. And I applaud you on that, because that's healthy. That means you're a good, you're a healthy church. You're wanting to go on, like Pastor Keith was saying. Let's go on in the things of God. Amen? So we're going to actually pick up where Pastor Keith left left off last week in Ephesians chapter 4. And he's talking to us. We're talking about how God created us for relationships. Actually, what I want you to do is go on over to Ephesians chapter 6. And today we're going to kind of hone in on the upside and the downside to relationships. Okay, the upside, the downside. Specifically, what we're going to look at, two things, just two simple things. Number one, we're going to look at the value of relationship. One primary value that you'll find throughout Scripture, scripture, throughout what God's created in the earth and so forth by his design. He's created value. There's a value in relationships that I want us to look at today. And also, let's be real. There's a balance to this. There's a cost in relationship, right? We understand that there's a cost to relationship, so we're going to look at that too, but I think you're going to be surprised at what we find in that cost of relationship. So take a look here at Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to pick up with verse 10. This is Paul talking to us, and he says, finally, say finally. finally. I like that word finally. That means we've gone through, we've, we've gone through a list of things, or we've gone through a progression, you know, we've been dealing with some things, and Finally, we're coming to a conclusion. We're about to make a turn here. And that's exactly what Paul's doing. Because see, where Pastor Keith was last week in Ephesians chapter 4, all through that chapter, and then on down into chapter 5, and on through the first half of chapter 6, Paul is talking to us about relationships, okay? Listing out different kinds of relationships, talking about the struggles, 
the challenges and the things that we deal in in relationships. And actually, he's gone through a whole list of relationships. He's talked about, actually, um, racism in the church, dealing with the issue of racism in the church. Um, you had your Jewish um, Christians and you had your Greek Christians, and there was a big divide between them. And it got nasty at times. So he had to address the whole issue of racism like we're even still dealing with today. Then he went on and talked about um, marriage relationships and how husbands and wives are to treat each other and how they're to submit to each other. He went on and talked about um, uh, parental relationships, how moms and dads are to relate to their kids and how kids are to relate to their parents, and on and on it goes. He went on into work environment. He talked about uh, employee and employer relationships. He even went on down to and dealt with the whole issue of slavery that they had to deal with in the church. So he's got this long laundry list, if you will, of the challenges and the struggles that the church was dealing with at that time. And so he finally, he comes down and he says, finally, and he goes on, he says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, or be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Now, let's stop there for a moment. Paul's gone through this whole long list in these past few chapters, and he said all this, and dealing with the, str the struggles and so forth and the challenges of relationships, he's dealt with our mess, okay? And he says, finally, you're going to have to be strong if you want to deal or have success in relationships with anybody else on the face of this earth. You're going to have to be strong in this number one relationship. You're going to have to be strong in your relationship with God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And then he goes on, he tells us how to be strong, how not to do it on our own, but how to be strong in God and his might. And he first says in verse 11, put on the full armor of God. Put on the full armor of God. Now, wait a minute, stop and think for a moment. I mean, we can read through that scripture, but just stop and think with me for just a moment. We're talking about relationships, right? We're talking about people, flesh and blood, um, warm bodies, Warm, fuzzy, feel goods, dating and marriage and children and kids and all this warm. Now he's talking about putting on armor. You see where I'm going with this? He's telling you to put on something that's, that I saw one just the other day, a suit of armor. He's telling you to put on a, a, something that's steel and hard and harsh looking and it's, you're dressed for battle. And he's telling you to put on the, the armor of God when you go into your relationships. I mean, does that seem odd to you? I mean, check this out. You've had a long day at the office. You've had a long day at work. Maybe you've worked a 12-hour shift, and you come, you come into the door, and you're about to walk in the house, and all of a sudden you say, wait, wait a minute. I've got to put on the full armor of God because I'm, I'm going to go into these relationships in here. And so let's see. i got a breastplate. Check. I've got that. Let's see. I've got my shield. Check. I've got my, I got my sword. Check. I've got my shin guards. I've got my helmet. Check. Then you kick open the door. You walk in and say, honey, I'm home. <laughs> what? And in the background, you hear, you hear your wife, you hear your husband, shoot, kids, hurry, get your armor, daddy's home, mama's home. There's going to be a fight, right? So Paul's saying, in relationships, if you want to really be successful, be strong in God, and here's how you do it, you put on your armor. That doesn't seem to really add up. What's going on here? Well, read on. He says, put on your full armor so that you may take a stand against who? The devil's schemes. I mean, isn't it tough enough that we're already having to deal with a handful of relationships that can be awfully messy at times, and now he's introducing this whole idea of devils? Huh? When's the last time you saw a devil? They just put down your hand. He's not sitting beside you. You didn't drop him off over in the kids' area. If you did, shame on you. <laughs> okay? What's this devil thing, Paul? We're talking about relations. Well, verse 12, he says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Turn to your neighbor and say, hi, I'm flesh and blood. <laughs> Turn to your other neighbor and say, but I'm not your problem. <laughs> For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. See, I told you, it's all Donald Trump's fault. It's all Obama's fault. It's all that little rocket man in North Korea's fault. That's the issue. That's why we got to have our armor on. No. That's not it. Can't play the blame game here, okay? No, he says it's against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Verse 13, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Oh, my gosh. Do you feel like when it comes to relationships, certain ones that you've done everything you possibly can do, that you've done all that you know to do, and, man, it's just like, what do I do now? You're at your wit's end. And you've just like come to yourself. Do you ever feel like that in some relationships? You're just like at the end of yourself. 
what do I do? Where do I go from here? Well, I'm glad you say that, and I'm glad you feel that way, because you're exactly where you need to be. In fact, you're actually where God wants you to be. You're at the end of yourself. And so today, we are going to talk about end times. In fact, the title of the message today is The End Times Message. Okay, let's pray. We're going to need to. God, thank you for relationships. Thank you for the gift you've given us of each other. Thank you for the gift that you've given us of you, in Jesus, in your Holy Spirit. God, we do want healthy relationships. We want a healthy home. We want healthy kids. We want healthy parents. Even as they grow older, we want healthiness in our relationships and in our bosses and our employees and our workplaces, even those people out in, the, in the, the highways and byways that we deal with in traffic day after day. We want health. And so I ask you now, connect us supernaturally to you, to each other in this time. Teach us, Holy Spirit, that we may know your ways in Jesus' name. Y'all agree with that? Amen. Amen. Go ahead and do your Bibles, Genesis chapter 1. I think it would be good and wise and smart on our behalf to go back to the beginnings, book of Genesis, and find out exactly um, the first recorded relationship that we have that God uses, and that's how he does things. He shows us the first whatever in Scripture, and that's what we, we call it a type and shadow, prophetic revelation, and so forth. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 and find that first relationship that we can use as believers in today's world, dealing with today's generation of people, and how to be successful in a relationship. Does that sound good? Okay. And we're going to pick up with verse 26 and see, this is the sixth day of creation. Now, God has created the heavens, the earth. He's created the sun, moon, and stars. He's put everything in place, and there's one last missing component. And guess what that is? It's you, and it's me. And see, verse 26 says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man, verse 27, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, obviously, the first relationship that we need to look at here is going to be Adam and Eve, right? Uh, the man, the woman, uh, male, female, because that's what we are, and, and that's what we need to model our relationships off, right? Would you agree with that? Sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> But don't stop answering out loud, okay? No. <laughs> Take a look back at verse 26. That's not the first relationship for us to model our lives off of. Verse 26 said this. God said, then let us, let us make man in who? Our image according to what? Now, I don't know about you, but either God has lost it after being alone for billions of years, and he's like, oh, my God, and he's talking, he's got these imaginary friends he's talking to, or something's going on here. You see what I'm saying? He's saying, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Here's something you need to understand in relationships. It starts with God. God is a triune being. That means he's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's three in one. He's not three pieces or three parts. He's three separate entities, three separate personalities, three separate persons, beings, if you will. He can be at different places, three different places at the same time, and yet he's everywhere, okay? So God is a triune being, and then what did he do? The word just said that he made us, you and me, in his image, right? So guess what? In the world of theology and psychology, we are considered a triune being as well. We are a spirit. We have a soul, and we live in this body, okay? Now, we could talk a lot about that, but you've heard that before from here, from this platform. So we are a triune being created in God's image, but here's what I want you to see. So when God created um, man, all that God is and all that God does is in him, right? So all the power, all the manifestations, everything. So there's this dispersion, this distribution of all that God is and all that he has scattered out through all of himself, Okay, so we now, as this triune being, guess what? It's the same thing for us. We have a spirit, soul, and body. Now, why did God take all of his power and so forth and put it into us? Because see, go back to verse 26. Read with me. Let us make God in our image, uh, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and then what? Let them do what? Let them rule. One translation says, so that they may rule. God departed in you all the dominion, all the authority, 
all the power that you could possibly ever need in order to rule not over just the earth, but the heavens and the earth, he's deposited in you. He deposited it in man, okay? He deposited it in Adam that day. Now, here's what you got to understand, though. Go ahead and look at, flip over one page to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. When you go from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 1 is basically the big picture of creation. It's just the, the steps of creation. The six days kind of lined out for us, okay? It's roughed out for us. Genesis chapter 2 then comes back behind and fills in the details. When you go through chapter 1, you realize he's talking about male and female, but you begin to realize in Genesis chapter 2 that there was only one to begin with. In fact, let's look at um, Genesis 2, verse 21. You see, God's created man in his image. There's Adam, okay? He's deposited all this power, all this authority, all, are you with me? All this dominion into this one person, this one man, this one being, so he could do what? So he could rule, okay? So he's got all that authority, but he realized, hey, things are going great here, but the guy's lonely because <laughs> Adam's not stupid. He's like, there's Mr. and Mrs. Horse, there's Mr. and Mrs. Cow, there, there's me and God, but they get to, and Genesis chapter 2 fills in the gaps, okay? <laughs> so verse 21, he says, so the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on man, and he slept, and then he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in that place. The Lord fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Verse 23, and the man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. This word um, woman means because she was taken out of man. So woman means taken out of man. Verse 24, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become what? They shall be one, come one flesh. See, God did the craziest thing. He made this one man and then he, Adam, he deposited all this power and authority and dominion so he could rule over all the earth, over the gardens, over the whole entire universe. Then he split them up. And then he expected him to get back together again, become one flesh. Well, in that process, guess what? All that authority, all that power, all that dominion that was deposited in man, it got dispersed. It got split up too. It got divided. It got distributed among Adam and Eve, and then they're their three boys, and then their kids, and then so on and so on, down to the, us, the body of Christ to this day. You see that? Does that make sense? So all this power and authority has been distributed, and now God expects all this to come back together again. So the first human relationship that we see is Adam and Eve, right, but Adam's got some pieces because we're focusing on this authority and power. Adam's got pieces of it, and God's got, I mean, um, Eve's got pieces of it. This brings us to our first point today, talking about the value of relationships. You ready for this? The strongest force that you'll ever see on the face of this earth is agreement. The strongest force that you'll ever see on the face of this earth is agreement. Because see, God created relationships for us, the value of having companionship and so forth. But it just so happens that in these relationships, guess what we find? We find power and authority and dominion. How do we get those? How do we get all that power and authority and dominion? Agreement. So in relationships, God intended for us to find agreement. He intended for us to find increase and blessing. Did it work? Oh yeah, it worked. In fact, you go on over to Deuteronomy chapter 32. This is Moses at the end of his days, and he's recounting all the glorious things that God had done for Israel. And he says, man, you know, I've seen one person put 1,000 to flight, and I've seen two people put not 2,000 to flight, but what? 10,000. Exponential power of agreement right there. Jesus gathered all of his disciples up at the end of his ministry in Matthew chapter 18. He said, now, um, if two of you agree on earth about asking anything, it will be done for you by my Father is, who is in heaven. Agreement, power, exponential, not one plus one equals two, but one plus one equals untold, unlimited amounts of power. Now flip over to Genesis chapter three. You with me? We good this morning? Now, you've got this agreement possibility, this potential to come into agreement to have all this exponential power and authority and dominion to rule, right? And so you can move that and direct that power into a direction that will bring positive results, like we saw from Moses and what Jesus was saying. You can accomplish things and get things done, but you can also direct that same agreement and power 
and produce negative results. Okay, let's talk about that for a moment. In fact, here in Genesis 3, we're going to start with verse 6. Now, here um, things have been humming along really well. God and Adam, and now Adam and Eve and God in this relationship. And so, man, they've been working together, walking through the garden together, and on and on it goes. But then one day, this other being, this other entity, remember the devils that Paul was talking about? Well, this is why I was talking about it. Because one day, Satan himself shows up in the garden in the form of a serpent. He possessed the serpent, and he works his way in the garden. He gets over to Eve, saddles up beside her, and says, hey, you know what? He starts having a conversation with Eve, talking about some instructions that God had given them from the beginning, which was, do not eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's all that you have to do. Just one thing you don't have to do. Well, that's the very thing that Satan came up and began talking to Eve about. See, that's his M.O., and we'll talk about that here in a moment. So, in verse 6, we pick up that conversation. At the end of that conversation, it says that when the woman saw, she began thinking things through, but all of a sudden she sees that the fruit of the tree was good for fruit or for food and pleasing to the eye. Ladies, resist it, okay? There's a reason why the devil wears Prada, okay? <laughs> resist that, okay? And she saw that it was desirable for gaining wisdom. She took and she ate. Oh, my gosh. And then she also gave some to her husband, who didn't say anything, but he was right there with her, and he did what? He ate. How many of you know that you don't have to voice something to come into agreement with somebody about a matter? She ate. She handed it to him and said, this is good. And then he did what? He ate, and what happened? They came into agreement. They came into agreement. Verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were open. They realized that they were naked. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of God. And what did they do? They hid. They separated themselves from God. They became divided from God. See, that's the MO of the enemy in our lives, in the earth. That's the devil's schemes that Paul was talking to us about in, in, in Ephesians chapter 6. He works his way into the garden. Satan works his way. The devil's hell work their way into your home, into your job. And your relationship, how? Talking. Remember, we're a triune being, okay? The way he works his way is in through our souls. It's called the battlefield of the mind because you are a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body, but that soul has a mind. It's your thinking capacity. It has a will, your want-tos. It has emotions, your feelings. So he comes in and he begins talking. You ever hear those whispers in your head that just... Where'd that come from? Right there. That's the enemy. Talking, speaking, anything that's speaking against God, that's the enemy. That's speaking against you. And there's a, there's a reason why he's doing that. He's trying to divide you from God, just like he divided him, uh, um, Eve from, um, from God. He's trying to, to separate, to pull you apart. He's trying to basically redirect that agreement away from the good things, and the promises, and the kingdom of God into darkness and evil. You see this? So he was able to divide woman from God, and she ate. And then he was able to redirect that power and authority and dominion when Adam ate, because they came into agreement, but they came into agreement against God. The result was, was it powerful? Oh, yes. This is where we see agreement is powerful in a negative direction, because it changed heaven and earth that day. It redirected the course of humanity, of mankind, even the entire universe. Everything was absolutely changed in a moment. Why? Because one man and one woman didn't verbally agree. They just ate something together and said, okay, we're good. We've got this. Agreement can change things. That's the power of agreement. So, again, agreement in any, rela in any relationship is the strongest force on the face of this earth. But God has intended for our agreement to, bring, to produce increase and blessing in our lives. Now, I've said all this, that to say this. I would like you to agree with me on something today, and I'm wondering if we can do this. Would you in, just entertain the idea that perhaps maybe that getting people for us to come into agreement is one of the hardest things on the face of this earth to do? You think so? Well, you're right. Good answer. Right answer, okay? It is, and I can prove it to you. So, we're going to walk out of this room in just a few moments, okay? 
And, and you're not going to be talking about, oh, man, how can we take the word of God now and just go into the next level with it? And, man, let's, let's just all get out in the parking lot here and praise God. The worship was so wonderful. No, you're going to cluster out there in the parking lot. You're going to get in your cars, and then one person, that brave soul, is going to ask that one question. So, what do you want to do for lunch today? <laughs> oh, my gosh, no, not that question, please. And if you happen to be in my car or one of our family cars, tissue boxes, umbrellas, things will come flying at you because we hate the person that asked that question. Why? Because they're forcing us to come into agreement. <laughs> we don't know. And God help you if you say Mexican because that was the default answer the past three weeks. Actually, the past three nights. Am I right, Pastor Keith? <laughs> Good answer. Agreement. That's why Amos... Chapter 3 says this, can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? Answer, no. I know from 32 years of experience, <laughs> me and Elizabeth are going to have a wonderful husband-wife walk, you know, bound out the door, and she's going that way, and I'm going this way, and she's going, what are you doing over there? And I'm like, well, why'd you go that way? <laughs> we come out of the mall. What are you going that direction for? Why are you going over there? Because it's where I parked the car. No, you didn't. You put, I've got the keys. I know where I parked the car. <laughs> it's impossible, it seems, to get two people to agree on one thing, right? But why is that? See, this is going to be the core issue right here. Why is it hard, so stinking hard, to get two people to agree just on one thing and one thing only? Remember, we're made in God's image, spirit, soul, and body. We've got a mind a will, a want to, and we've got emotions. What's the purpose of all that? So your mind, your mind, your mind will and your emotions, your soul is where all the changes and all the decision making goes on for you to rule. Okay? You're trying being, God's created you in your mind to be able to process spiritual things, process natural things, and come to a conclusion and a decision. So you've got a mind, you've got a will, and you've got emotions. Now, the challenge is, is well, I want to go this way. Well, I want to go that way. Well, I really think and I really believe and I think I've got a word from God. I know I've got a word from God that we should go. You know, I really think, I really feel, I really believe we should go this way. How are you going to get two people to come into agreement? How do you, you've got to get all those want to's. You've got to get all those emotions. You've got to get all that thinking, those mindsets. You've got to get um, that will um, um, moving in one direction. Why is that hard? Simply this, because you've been created to rule. And you've got a mind, and your own mind, will, and emotions. God has entrusted that to you. And so you're going to make this decision. If it was just you and God, that's easy, right? I have wonderful, quiet times, wonderful times in the Lord. I just come out, and life is one, just going wonderfully until I happen to run into a human being. My wife, my kids, everything, and maybe a dog and a cat too, but they don't have souls. But you get it? If it's just you and God, man, we're cruising, God. We're going places. We're doing things. But then all of a sudden, boom, here comes another mind, will, and emotion that's designed by God himself, his design, to rule, to make decisions, to go somewhere, to get things done. That's the challenge that we run into. That's the reason why we run it. So this brings us to our, our second play, point. Well, let me say this first, because this then is the place where we can come into a situation where one or both of us is going to have to compromise if we're going to get somewhere, right? This is also the place, this is the point where one or both of us can get what? Hurt. Get wounded. Our feelings get stepped on because we're just going the other direction. And that's when we want to do this. We want to put up our crime scene tape and go, uh-uh, I'm not going to let this happen again. Don't do that to me. And so we kind of cordon ourselves off. You see that? Or, we don't even, or else we might get into an impasse. We don't get anywhere. Now, this brings us to our second point, the cost of relationships. You with me? The cost of relationship is this. Relationships will always cost you. In fact, relationships will always, 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 always cost you. But here's the good news. Re hang on. Relationships do not have to hurt you. You may think that sounds pretty strong, pretty bold. Well, it is. <laughs> but 
but it's not Joe's idea, okay? This is God talking throughout the word. Relationships do not have to hurt us. Now, start wrapping this up. Remember how in Genesis chapter 2, the first human relationship began. God did surgery on Adam. He took a rib out, um, and then he began creating Eve out of that. What happened there? That Adam's relationship with Eve cost him, didn't it? Cost him a rib. Physically, it cost him in order to have that relationship. Well, see, God's designed it that way. God has designed it such that relationships require us to give up something of ourselves. You see this? In healthy relationships and in unhealthy relationships, they will always cost us. This is by God's design. So, yeah, sure, they will cost us time and energy and money and all kinds of resources to be in relationships with people, right? But it will also cost you in your soul. It's going to cost you some mindsets. It's going to cost you some feelings. It's going to cost you some want-tos, some desire. Does this make sense? Do you see this? It's going to cost you, and guess what? That's the hard part. It's kind of where the rubber meets the road kind of thing here. But you know what? Jesus, being the good capitalist that he was, passed on that, that, that cost of relationship along to the consumer, you and me. And he did that when he said this, if you want to be my disciple, in other words, if you want to be in relationship with me, then you're going to have to do some things. And here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to deny yourself. Say, I've got to deny myself if I want to be in relationship with Jesus. You've got to deny yourself if you want to be in relationship with Jesus. And then he said, then you've got to take up your cross. What's that cross for? Killing things, crucifying. What? Your mind, your will, your emotions, your flesh. Now, God will leave your dreams and desires and so forth intact, and he cares about your feelings and all that stuff, but we know we've got to, desi- we've got to die to our flesh, right? And then he said, take up your cross and follow after me. In other words, if you want to be in relationship with God, if you want to go where Je- you're going to have to go where Jesus is going and doing what he's doing and saying what he's saying, if you want to be in relationship with, with him. Paul said it like this. He echoed it. He said, for I have been, in Galatians chapter 20, or 2, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live, I live by hope or faith in the Son of God, talking about Jesus, who loved me and gave himself up for me. The idea being that Jesus came and gave himself up for me. Now I'm going to give myself up for him. What are you going to give up? Where you want to go, what you want to do, what you want to say, your mind, your will, your emotions. You see this? It's going to cost you. So Jesus has set this in motion if you want to get into relationship with him, if you want to get into agreement with him and see a measurable power and authority and dominion released in this earth. Amen. Praise God. So relationships will always cost you. You have to give up something for these relationships. There's going to be skin in the game. Now, how do we get to the end of our, this is how we get to the end of ourself in the beginning of God in our lives. But again, let me say this, relationships cost, but they don't have to hurt you. They don't have to wound your heart, the real you. Relationships are not designed by God to diminish you, deplete you, or destroy you. That's where the enemy comes in. That's what he's trying to do. So you're wondering to yourself, well, then how can I make sure that doesn't happen in my life, that I'm not depleted, that I'm not diminished, that I'm not destroyed? Well, remember um, in Genesis chapter 3, when the eyes of Adam and Eve were opened, what happened? They realized that they were what? They were naked. What happened was, is once they came into agreement against God, all that covering, all that glory, all that presence of God was removed. And they were left vulnerable. They were left exposed. They were left open to wounds and to hurts, not just from the enemy, but to each other. Because immediately after the next, in the next chapter, they started doing what? Duking it out. God called everybody together and they said, well, she did it. Well, he did it. Well, they did it. And on and on it goes. You see that? We've been left um, opened and exposed. How do we keep that from happening now? How, how do we get covered back up? Well, let's conclude right here. Go back to Ephesians chapter 6. Go back to what Paul told us. We'll get through this quickly. Verse 10, be strong in the Lord and the power of, in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Is this all making sense now? Another level of revelation? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. We've got that. 
but against the rulers, the authorities, against the powers, talking about the devils of hell, against spiritual forces, verse 13. So then put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, when the enemy comes against you, you may be able to do what? To stand and then stand firm. Okay, now we could do a whole series on just the armor of God, but take a look at verses 14 and 17. Actually, don't do that. Look in your, your insert there. We've got these listed out, the, um, the, the pieces of the armor of God. So Paul is telling you, okay, you've been exposed, you've been revealed, you've become vulnerable now. Now it's time for you to be covered back up. How are you going to protect yourself? How is God wanting to protect you? How has he empowered you to be protected in relationships? Number one, put on the belt of truth. The belt of truth is what God says about you. It's, it's what holds everything together. The truth about you, spoken and written down by God, is what holds you together in your life. Number two, the breastplate of righteousness. That means being rightly related with God and with people. This is where forgiveness comes in. This is where there's nothing. Your responsibility is to make sure there's nothing between you and God. No offense, no wrong. So you do what? You begin to repent. Forgive me. I didn't mean to say that. I didn't mean to do that. And this is how you make sure there's nothing between you or somebody else in this relationship. You repent. You, um, they come to you and you forgive them. So we're not going to go deep on that, but that's where forgiveness comes in because it keeps you in a right relationship with people. It keeps your heart right. It keeps your heart tender. It keeps your heart protected too. Okay, so that's breastplate of righteousness. Shoes of peace. Walk in the presence of God everywhere you go. Be a blessing by bringing the presence and the power of God to everything and everyone around you. The shield of faith, that's what extinguishes all the devil's uh, flaming arrows. The helmet of salvation, that's your soul being delivered and protected, your mind, your will, and your emotions, okay? By um, the salvation of God being manifest over your soul. The sword of the spirit, that's the word of God. Enforcing the feet, now, this is what the word of God does. By you declaring and speaking, like us having bracelets that say covered on it. What's this? Just a reminder to declare the word of God, Psalm 91, over my household. No weapon formed against me will prosper. What am I doing? I'm coming into agreement with the word of God. I'm coming into agreement with God himself. And so that brings exponential power of protection over me and my household. So what I'm doing, my responsibility to protect myself is not really to protect myself, but just speak the word of God, come into agreement with him. And guess what? I am enforcing everything that Jesus has, the, the victory that Jesus has inflicted on the enemy. I am enforcing the victory that Jesus inflicted on the enemy. You see that? So those are the pieces of the, um, the armor of God that we're to put on. Now, say uh, Adam and Eve lost that covering. Jesus has restored that covering to you today to where there's no access of the enemy into your heart. And consequently, people's words, things they say, things that they do, they can just fall by the wayside. Okay, you got this? So the most powerful force on the face of this earth is agreement. I challenge you today, as you go out those doors, start looking for that agreement. Start looking for opportunities for agreement in your relationships. Relationships will cost you. We talked about that. So as you go out today, look for opportunities in your relationships to invest. Don't see it as cost. See it as an opportunity to invest in relationships because it will have exponential returns for you. And finally, relationships don't have to hurt you. Put on the full armor of God. But we do get hurt in relationships, don't we? Our hearts get wounded. Things penetrate. They get in there. God will heal you. Amen? Praise God. I had Colossians chapter 3 in there. Um, we don't have time to read that. But as we close this morning, go ahead and take out your Connect card because I'm going to give you some two steps, two next steps. First one is, on the back of your Connect start card, it says, my next step is look for opportunities of agreement. Look for opportunities of agreement. Number two is put on the full armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. How do you do that? You pray. And I'm going to show you how to do that in just a moment. Pray, put on the full armor of God. Let's go ahead and bow our heads now. As we wrap this up. And I want to share with you a prayer the Lord gave me. From time to time, the Lord gives me prayers to pray from Scripture. A couple of years ago, he gave me the, the, this very passage of Scripture we're talking about. And so I began praying it, and I began to experience the power of this. And so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to read it out loud to you right now. I just want you to listen, get still, 
And listen to this, this prayer. And then after we finish, I finish reading it. I'm going to ask you to pray it out loud with me, okay? And this is my prayer the Lord gave me. Father, help me to walk in righteousness. Help me to walk in truth and in peace with you, within myself, and with others around me. Surround me with your faith as a shield. Cover me with your salvation as a helmet. Empower me with your word as a sword. Your kingdom advancing in, on, and through my life. Let's pray this together. Pray this after me. Father, help me to walk in righteousness, in truth, and in peace with you, within myself, with all the people around me. Surround me with your faith as a shield. Cover me with your salvation as a helmet. Empower me with your word as a sword. May your kingdom advance in and through my life today. In Jesus' name. If you keep your head bowed and your eyes closed this morning. God is in this place. And if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with him, I want to give you the chance to do that today. How do you live this righteous life that we just prayed? We do it through Jesus. How do we have peace in our situation and within ourselves? We do it through Jesus. It all starts with this relationship. It starts with a relationship with him. All you got to do is respond in faith. You don't have to get perfect. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to have all the wisdom that there is in the Bible. No, it just, all it requires of you is just to respond to God and to accept Jesus into your life, to believe in him. So today, if you're here and you don't have that relationship, or maybe you've had the relationship before, but you just have walked away, and today you want to rededicate your life to him. If that's you today, I want you to join me and the rest of the the family here at Pathpoint in praying this prayer out loud. So everybody join me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I believe in him right now. He's the son of God. Today I repent of my sin and I call upon the name of the Lord. I am saved right now in Jesus' name. Now with your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you made a decision just to follow him or rededicate your life, would you just slip up your hand nice and high so we know who made that decision good? I see that hand. I see that hand. I see your hands, hands going up in this place. Thank you, Lord, for doing a work in your people. Thank you that we get to have relationship with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give all those who made a decision a big hand clap today. Amen. Amen. Well, today you can take your Connect card. I hope you filled out your next steps. You can take that Connect card and drop it in our offering boxes today. Also, if you came into a relationship with Jesus for the first time or you rededicated your life, we have a book for you called Knowing Christ. It's free. Grab it on your way out. If you're our first-time guest today, we also have a free book for you called What Seems Impossible, written by Pastor Scott Johnson, our senior pastor. Those are two gifts for you to help you and uh, in your walk with God. Please grab those as you leave the service today. And before we we get out of here, I just want to give you the chance to worship God in your giving. We give you this chance because we believe this is what it means to be a fully devoted follower of Christ, that um, we, we, we follow him in every area of our life. Look at Philippians 4.19. It says, This same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs, from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now, as you go to give today, I want to ask you this question. Are you focusing on what you're giving, or are you focusing on the unlimited glorious riches which have been given to you in Christ Jesus? What are you focusing on? 
This is what offering, it gives you the chance to get your mind off your finances, the way that you see them, the way that the world tells you to see it, and to start looking at things through the perspective of God. That when I give, I'm looking at God who has an unlimited supply, who is rich, who has glorious riches. And guess what? They're provided to you and me through Christ Jesus. We've been talking about Jesus a lot today. He didn't just stop by, by forgiving you. and, and per, No, he provided glorious riches for you as well. As you give today, shift your perspective over onto him, over onto his glorious riches, not on, oh, man, I don't know, this hurts a little bit. No, 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 hold on. I'm going to think about him and what he can give to me, amen, and what he wants for my life and for the people who are in my life. Amen. Let's pray over our offering. God, we thank you for all the good things that you've given us today. We know that they've come from you. Today, we respond out of worship in our giving. We worship you with it. We say that you are God and you have glorious riches and they've been given to us. God, bless these people, the the givers here today. Bless them with your glorious riches. Shower it down on their life that they prosper in everything that they do. In Jesus' name. If you agree, say amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here today. If you would stand to your feet, you can drop your offering in our offering boxes as you leave today. But before you head out, I want to declare over you, you are the head and you are not the tail. You are above and you are not beneath. Everything you put your hand to this week will prosper. Go ahead and look for somebody and something to get into agreement with and release power into this universe and into our community. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Point somebody to the path. You're dismissed.